Chapter 15 Happy Ending I object, Peter cried. My wife to be isn't a dimwit. She's a heroine. I object too, Adra said. Phil's a hero. All right, all right, Jimmy said. But it's getting on toward dawn. Marjorie and I are dimwits. Just tell me whether or not we're rich or poor. We're rich, Philip said as he drew from his pocket the bulging envelope he had earlier been forced to hand over to Taggart. He handed it to Penny. Open it, sis. Her hands shaking with excitement, Penny lifted the flap and pulled out a wad of musty-smelling, yellowed stock certificates. Those ancient documents, Phil told her quietly, don't look like much. But, according to Taggart's confession... When we turn them in, we'll collect about $50,000, their cash value plus back dividends and interest. For a moment, no one spoke. Then Jimmy yelled, Whoopee! The hidden treasure is found at last. And boy, oh boy, will I ever get the finest sailboat that was ever launched. I can't believe it, Marjorie said in an odd voice. Why, I'm... I'm an heiress. I can't believe it, Peter said, pretending to be mournful. Penny will never marry poor penniless me now. Of course not, Penny said with a laugh. And now Phil doesn't have to marry Adra for her money either. Everyone laughed then, almost hysterically. They were all tired and overstimulated. Dawn was pinking the sky in the east. If you ask me, Jimmy said, stretching and yawning, I'd say we all ought to catch a little shut-eye. I, for one, won't believe any part of Phil's yarn until I hear it all over again in broad daylight. But the next morning, after consulting the older men who were staying at the lodge, the Allens learned that the old stock certificates were worth even more than Taggart had estimated. I know the company well, Mr. Curtis told Phil. Bought stock in it myself a few years ago when it got a government loan and staged a comeback. And then, to the delight of everyone, Adra's father, Mr. Prentice, arrived by plane. They were all eager for the advice of such an experienced businessman. I wouldn't sell, he said, after hearing the whole story. You couldn't invest your money in a safer concern. When you collect your back dividends, you'll each have a tidy sum if you need cash now. If not, I would reinvest that money and thus provide yourselves with a comfortable yearly income from it and the original investment. He smiled at them. I'll handle the whole matter for you, if you like. Please do, Penny cried. Oh, it's all so wonderful. Peter and I can get married right away, and Marjorie and Jimmy are assured of college educations. What about us? Philip crossed over to stand beside Adra, who was perched on the arm of her father's chair. Sir, he said with old-fashioned formality, your daughter has done me the honor of promising to become my wife. With your permission, we would like to be married sometime this fall. Marjorie could not suppress a giggle. Phil did look as though he ought to be wearing a Prince Albert coat instead of a sports jacket and slacks. Mr. Prentice stood up to shake hands gravely with Philip. You have my permission, sir, he said, a smile twitching the corners of his mouth. And my blessing. Peter grabbed Penny's hand. Come on, let's celebrate. No more work today for any of the Allens. But Phil and Penny could not take a holiday so soon. Most of the guests were making arrangements for their departures. Phil and Penny had to be everywhere at once to help them pack and ship off their luggage or to make reservations for them on planes and buses. Judy flatly refused to leave with her parents and Alf. I've got to stay here for Penny's wedding, she begged. Marjorie and I are going to be bridesmaids. Then we'll stay too, Mrs. Powell said and added to Penny. That is, if we're invited. Of course you are, Penny cried. The Curtises and Adra and her father are going to stay on for the great event, so we'll have one grand house party until then. By Labor Day evening, all of the other guests had left the lodge. 
To celebrate the first dinner of the wedding day house party, Pat opened a bottle of champagne that he claimed to have held over from his wedding for another special occasion. Ugh! Marjorie spluttered after one sip. What horrible tasting stuff! Jimmy, Judy, and Alf heartily agreed with her and gratefully accepted the ginger ale and Mary hastily substituted for the bubbling wine. Peter proposed a toast. Here's to the Allens of Allen Lodge. May they always be happy and prosperous. You'd better include the Wylands in that toast, Marjorie said with an impish grin. Penny won't be an Allen much longer. A few days later, on a beautiful, bright September morning, the wedding took place. Marjorie and Judy were so excited, they couldn't fasten the zippers on their crisp organdy frocks. Penny, sweetly serene, came to the rescue, wearing her lovely flowing gown of white tulle over taffeta. Marjorie finally conquered her nervousness long enough to pin on the clusters of orange blossoms which held Penny's lace veil in place. Then, carrying Pat's enormous bridal bouquet of long-stemmed white chrysanthemums, Penny came from the house on Philip's arm to join Peter under the trees. Marjorie held her breath while Penny and Peter made their vows in clear, steady voices. After the ceremony was over, Charles was the first to congratulate the bridegroom, and Marjorie the first to kiss her sister. You didn't act scared at all, she whispered. I know I would have said I don't instead of I do, just because I was so nervous. She turned to give Peter a hug. It's so nice to have another brother, she cried, and to know that soon I'll have another sister. A merry wedding breakfast was served on the sunny porch, and this time it was Marjorie who proposed a toast. To Allen Lodge, she cried, holding her punch glass high, where there's never a dull moment. Here's hoping that it holds some new adventure just waiting to be discovered. I'm with you there, sis cried Jimmy. But Peter and Penny only smiled happily. The End <laughs>